Okay, now we're going to introduce a new quantity, namely angular momentum. We considered when an object moves through space, the amount of motion could be um, accounted for by how much stuff is moving and how fast it's moving. And we called that combination momentum. That really should be called translational momentum because this is an object translating through space. Now that we've looked at objects that are rotating, we can also ask, is there an equivalent quantity of motion for rotation? And there is. It's called angular momentum. And again, it's defined as inertia in motion. Only now inertia will be the moment of inertia, which is the rotational inertia. And the velocity will be the angular velocity. So we'll use the symbol L for angular momentum. And it will be simply the moment of inertia I times the angular velocity omega. And this will be for an object simply spinning around a fixed axis. Notice that the angular momentum is a vector, and its direction will be defined as parallel to the angular velocity vector. The units for angular momentum have no special name. They are simply units of angular uh, rotational inertia, which is just kilogram times meter squared, times the units of angular velocity, which is just per second. So it's a really weird just kilogram meter squared per second. And unfortunately, it does not have a name. Now, as we saw before, just because something is moving in a straight line doesn't mean it doesn't have a sense of rotational motion. So here we can consider just an object, a ball, moving at a constant velocity, and we'll consider a, our frame of reference to be have an origin at this point right here, we'll call O. So the object will just move in a straight line at a constant velocity. Notice that it'll move through an angle, and we can therefore define an angular velocity, which will simply be this angle divided by however long it takes it to go from here to here. So we can calculate an angular velocity. Note again, the amount of angular velocity we have depends on what our point of view is, namely what point O are we going to consider as our axis of rotation. Because effectively, this is an axis of rotation perpendicular to the screen, uh, coming out of the screen, and centered at point O. If we picked another point over here, we'd get a different value for the angular velocity. But angular speeds, just like translational speeds, depend on your point of view. We could say, could use a different frame of reference to define our velocity v, in which case we get a different value. Now, if this object has a sense of rotational motion, it must have a sense of angular momentum. And the way we're going to calculate this is L will now be r cross p, where r is a vector going from the axis of rotation, our reference point O here, to the object, crossed into its translational momentum m times the velocity v. Now, we can show that this is in fact mathematically identical to the original definition by simply writing out the magnitude of this r cross p, so just r times mv, times the sine of the angle in between them. This is the angle in between the r vector and the v vector. Oops. Now, take the sine of this angle and attach it to the velocity v, and sine of this angle times the velocity v will be the velocity that is perpendicular to r, and that is because the sine of this angle is the same as the sine of this angle, and the sine of this angle times the velocity v will be the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to r. There also will be a parallel component to the velocity to the, the r vector right here, and that'll be the fact that the object could be moving either closer to or further away from the point O here, but that will not contribute to its rotational motion about that point O. So L will now be multiplying and dividing by r, mr squared, and then the other will divide by r, v perpendicular divided by r, that's just omega, remember our definitions from rotational kinematics, this is just i, this is just omega, so this L, which we calculated from r cross p, will give us i times omega. The two definitions are, in fact, equivalent. However, notice here if I take i times omega, 
I will not be constant as this object moves r, the distance from o to the object will be changing, which means I will not be constant. In addition, omega will not be constant. However, the product of i times omega, which is this product right here, r m v times the sine of the angle, except now we can show that it's constant by taking the sine and rather than basically multiplying it by the v, multiply it by the r, and then if we take this right here is the direction it's moving, and this right here is r perpendicular, remember the sine of this angle is the same as the sine of that angle, so r times the sine of this angle is this perpendicular distance right here, and as it moves in a straight line, that distance will not change. So r times the sine of theta will be a constant, m is a constant, v we've already said is a constant, therefore l will be a constant. So an object moving in a straight line at a constant velocity will in fact have a constant angular momentum, which it has to because here there are no torques being applied to it. Remember when we considered the falling apple, there was a torque being applied, there was a force, the object was speeding up. Now we have an object at a constant velocity. Now when we did linear momentum or translation momentum, we related it to forces by taking and rewriting F equals MA to say force is actually the rate of change of translational momentum. Well now we could ask, now that we've defined angular momentum, is angular momentum related to torque? Namely, is it the rate of change of angular momentum? Well here is our definition of angular momentum and we'll take the derivative of it with respect to time and see what we get. So DDP, DDT of R cross P is just distribute that out, is the derivative of R with respect to T crossed into P plus R crossed into DP DT, just using the product rule. Now, dr dt, well, that's just v, and m, uh, p is just m times v, so this is v crossed into m, which is a scalar, and a constant, so you could take that out. v cross v, well, a vector crossed into itself is the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the sine of the angle in between them. It's the same vector, so the sine of zero is zero, so this term is zero. However, this right here, dp dt, is already the force. So therefore, this right here will equal r cross f, but r cross f is just the torque. So in fact, the rate of change of the angular momentum is the torque, just like the rate of change of translation momentum is the force. Now here we used our second definition of angular momentum. Could have used the first one, L equals I times omega. Take the derivative of this definition for angular momentum, I will be a constant, with an object spinning around a fixed axis. Take the derivative of just the angular velocity, that's just the angular acceleration, but torque equals I times alpha. So again, the rate of change of this angle momentum is the torque. So we have now shown that the rate of change of angular momentum is the torque. This then leads to the notion that if the torque is the rate of change of angular momentum, and there is no net torque, then the angular momentum does not change, or it is conserved. So if the net torque is zero, then the angular momentum will be a constant. That means if I take a system with no net torque acting on it, angular momentum will be a conserved quantity. Just like if there are no net forces acting on a system of objects, that system also has the conservation of translational momentum. This then leads to the fairly common example of we have a person standing on a platform and they, which is just like a skater that is spinning around, pull your arms in, and you start spinning faster. This is an example of the conservation of angular momentum. There are no torques acting on the person. If you pull your arms straight in, you're not applying a torque. However, you are reducing your moment of inertia, and to keep the angular momentum the same, if this number gets bigger, uh, excuse me, this number gets smaller, then this number must get bigger so they, you must be spinning faster. However, note something interesting. Kinetic energy is one-half I omega squared. I omega is constant. However, omega is still increasing. Does that mean the kinetic energy increased? But energy is also conserved. How can we have 
angular momentum stay the same, and energy seemingly increasing. Well, here we'd have the advantage if we actually did the demo. We could show that it actually takes force to bring your arms in. And if it takes force to bring your arms in, that means you're applying a force over a distance and doing work. The work that you do to pull your arms in will, in fact, be the work that will increase your kinetic energy. The faster you spin, the harder it is to pull your arms in, the more work it takes to pull your arms in, because your kinetic energy will be increasing. So energy is still being conserved, but you are, in fact, doing work to increase your kinetic energy. Now, we should look at the difference between the conservation of angular momentum, which I'll designate as COL, versus the conservation of translation momentum, which is COP, by considering the following example. Here we have a merry-go-round. We have a child running towards the merry-go-round, and she's going to jump on the merry-go-round. She will have linear momentum before she jumps on it, and after she jumps on it, the merry-go-round will be spinning around the axis. She will have angular momentum. Have we converted her linear momentum into angular momentum? And the answer is no, because those are two separate quantities. Each are, is individually conserved. What we're really seeing is in advance, she did have angular momentum because she had translational momentum and the only way to get the merry-go-round to start spinning is if she jumps somewhere here on the edge. Or, if you will, there was a, a distance between her and her direction of motion. Namely, she has effectively that R perpendicular, which means she had angular momentum relative to the axis of rotation of the merry-go-round. If you jump straight on, running straight towards the center of the merry-go-round, you won't set the merry-go-round into motion. You have to jump off on towards the edge. Now, what happened to the linear momentum? Well, we'll make the simple assumption that this axis right here, this axle, is in fact anchored in the ground. So her linear momentum in this inelastic collision would be transferred to the ground. So the ground would have to recoil. But of course, as we've already noted, the Earth is so much more massive, we don't notice that. If, on the other hand, this were on ice, the merry-go-round would continue moving forward after the child had jumped onto it and would also be spinning around. So let's consider an example where we have the merry-go-round anchored on the ground, have a mass of 200 kilograms and a radius of 2 meters, and we'll treat it as a disc. The child have a mass of 45 kilograms, will be running at 5 meters per second, and we'll assume jumps on at the edge right here. Using the conservation of angular momentum, before jumping, the angular momentum would be r cross p, where we will use r as the r perpendicular, which is the radius of the, the disc, the merry-go-round. This is where she's going to jump on. So, And then this is her mass times her velocity. So this is her linear momentum. This is how much angular momentum we have before she jumps on. After she jumps on, the angular momentum will be calculated I times omega. Remember, these two formulations are mathematically identical. This is just more convenient here. So now we have to calculate the moment of inertia of the merry-go-round plus the child when the child is on the merry-go-round. Well, the merry-go-round is a disk. Moment of inertia is one-half mr squared. We know the mass. We know the radius. We will treat the child as a point mass located on the edge of the merry-go-round. Her moment of inertia will just be mr squared. Plugging the numbers in, we get the value for the moment of inertia. So the angle momentum before and after have to be equal. Angle momentum before was 450. Moment of inertia is 580 times the angular velocity omega gives me an angular velocity of 0.776 radians per second. We can then calculate the period, which is just 2 pi radians divided by the angular velocity, to give a period of 8.1 seconds. So after she jumps on, it'll take a little more than 8 seconds for her to spin around once. Now, we also can consider collisions between objects that are now, both of which are free to move. So here we have one disk coming in, colliding with a second one that is at rest. We will assume this is an inelastic collision and they stick together. What happens to the velocity, the center of mass, after the collision? Remembering they are sticking together. 
well, three possibilities. It either ends up somewhere up here, it ends up somewhere down here, or it continues straight. So what I want you to do is think about that for a moment, and then try to answer it. Well, hopefully you thought about it, and you realize this is the conservation of momentum. If the momentum before the collision is horizontal, it has to be horizontal after the collision. And the momentum will be associated with the motion of the center of mass. So the center of mass of this system must continue forward in the same direction the blue puck was going before the collision. If it were to move upward or downward, then we would have violated the conservation of momentum because there was no vertical momentum before the collision. So it has to be continued moving straight ahead. So let's consider an example where we're using both the conservation of translational and angular momentum. So here we'll have two identical pucks, so they will collide. They will stick together right at their edge. So first we can ask, how fast is the center of mass of our system going? Well, that's just the conservation of translational momentum. Beforehand, the initial momentum is just mass times velocity. Only one of the pucks is moving. Afterwards, both pucks will be moving at some common velocity, and since twice the mass is moving, it must have half the velocity. So the center of mass will continue moving at half the velocity, so I have the same translational momentum. However, if they stick together right here, in effect, the blue puck will apply a torque to the red puck and force the two of them to spin around in this direction. And we can use the conservation of angular momentum to find out how fast. Since beforehand, we just have an object translating through space, and it's going to be rotating around this point right here, we can calculate the angular momentum by finding the distance between the line of motion of the blue puck and its eventual axis of rotation, which will be this point right here. That's this distance right here, but this distance will be the radius of the puck. So the angular momentum before will be r times mv0. Angular momentum afterwards will be I times omega, and this will be the rotational motion around the center of mass. That is this point P right here. So we've got two disks rotating on a point on their edge. Well, we can use the parallel axis theorem to get their combined moments of inertia. There are two disks. The moment of inertia around the center of mass is 1 half mr squared plus m times the distance between the center of mass of each puck and the center of mass of the system, that's just the radius, add those up, multiply by 2, and this is the moment of inertia of the two pucks combined. So now we can use the conservation of angular momentum, set this before equal to this after, and find out the angular velocity is one-third v0 over r.